Welcome everyone. I'm Tony Roskilly and I'm a Professor of Energy Systems and Co-Director of Durham Energy Institute at Durham University. This is the second day of our four-day uh, Net Zero Research Conference. The first two days of this conference are structured around the themes of Network H2, that's the Network for Hydrogen Field Transportation, which is funded by EPSRC and led by myself at uh, Durham University. The network brings together uh, researchers, companies, governments, um, and other stakeholders across the UK and interacts with uh, internationally leading organizations and research researchers across uh, many different countries in, in the transport field. The structure of the uh, network is around eight uh, cross-cutting themes. Um, Firstly, on whole transport and energy systems and the interaction uh, between them. Pathways to sustainable hydrogen production and its distribution. Compact and uh, lightweight hydrogen storage. And uh, more compact light and lightweight onboard hydrogen energy uh, conversion uh, devices. Also on improved lightweighting and efficiency of uh, electrified powertrains for transport applications, hydrogen compatibility of um, materials and their safety. And the final two themes are on uh, multimodal transport logistics and autonomy and policy, economics and societal impact. So EPSRC um, uh, funds this uh, national network, uh, as I mentioned, and has been uh, awarded to us to allow us to act as a forum uh, to maximize impact from the research that they fund and the research that UKRI um, fund, and to communicate and share back best practice and disseminate information and data uh, all around the theme of hydrogen fuel transportation, and that's all uh, transport modes. Um, also to uh, capture state of the art and identify the research challenges from that exercise and examine ways to incentivize and, and look at the barriers that, that exist to the take up of hydrogen for transport. We also have 50% uh, uh, of our funding to support new research programs. Uh, so funding um, cross-cutting projects to unlock uh, research on hydrogen transport applications. Also, we aim to provide a wider forum for all stakeholders, uh, again, for all modes of transport and technology developers, and to foster long-term collaborations between outstanding international research teams. And finally, to engage with the wider research community across um, the physical sciences, social sciences and engineering disciplines to maximize dissemination and impact of the research outcomes and to stimulate knowledge transfer between academia, industry, uh, government and other stakeholders. So over the, the two days uh, we have been, we are looking at uh, the challenges across different forms of transport, uh, as well as the developing the supply chain to support this uh, hydrogen transition. So today is uh, organized in three parts. So uh, a net zero uh, question time panel with questions provided by uh, the attendees. First of all, I should probably introduce each person in turn and then I'll ask them the question. Uh, so first up, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Anthony Velaquez, who's a, a head of decarbonisation at TRL. Uh, he's a doctor in engineering with more than 10 years of experience advising companies and governmental bodies about the decarbonisation challenge. And two of his areas of expertise are low carbon transport and energy pathways. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I've just introduced Anthony, I'll now give him the first question and then I'll ask, every, I'll go introduce each one and they can answer these questions individually. 
So, uh, Tony, the first question is around, um, is hydrogen for transport the value chain, is it efficient enough? Um, and, and does that really matter? I mean, most people, this is a common question asked about hydrogen, is it, is it an efficient enough value chain? And but does ultimately that really matter? Um, hi, um, thank you for inviting me for this uh, discussion. Uh, the insights I can provide is from the many, many conversations I have had with uh, the transport sector organizations with which we collaborate. We have been involved in low emission freight trials, including the, 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 the assessment of uh, dual fuel hydrogen diesel. Uh, and now as well, I've been involved uh, in an effort to create consortium to take advantage of a new opportunity from DFT looking at zero emission road freight uh, trials. Uh, and as well, I have a, a background in hydrogen systems before, before joining TRL. So from an academic background, I can say, no, it's not efficient. <laughs> uh, but the reality is... Uh, that it doesn't really matter to the end clients. The end clients, what they are interested in is in the total cost of ownership of the vehicles. We run a number of workshops uh, a month ago to understand, understand the drivers for decarbonization for uh, UK freight and all the different focus groups from road haulage to shipping and rail uh, say the same. The most important factor is total cost of ownership. So as long as the, the, the hydrogen uh, value chain can deliver cost efficient solutions, it doesn't matter to the end clients. Obviously, yeah, ideally we would want to be an extremely uh, efficient supply chain, but at the end of the day, with the right uh, uh, energy pathways, if they are decarbonized enough and they are cheap, maybe the efficiency is not as extremely important as if it would be a fossil fuel. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next up, we've got uh, Nazimi, who is a senior lecturer in uh, energy economics and the head of the Center of Energy Systems and Strategy at Cranfield University. Uh, building on her interdisciplinary training as an urban planner, her research focuses on spatial understanding of energy systems transitions and associated implications for policy and planning. And I guess the same question comes to you um, in terms of, uh, is a hydrogen for transport value chain efficient enough? And does that really matter? Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I think uh, I echo what um, Anthony was saying that first of all, um, it is necessary because we, the government now yesterday articulated that they want to reduce, we want to reduce our emissions by 78% by 2035. So that is really an ambitious, so it's necessary that we have to decarbonize transport. And in terms of whether it is efficient enough or it's a sufficient condition on its own, I think it depends on two key factors. One is, what happens in the other transport sector? So for example, are we going to see hydrogen fueled aircrafts? Are we going to have ships and boats, et cetera, fueled by hydrogen? What is going to happen in railways? So depending on what goes on in the rest of the transport sector, I think this could be sufficient on its own. However, I would also anticipate that I think there also has to be the second option, which is this, transport network shouldn't be exclusive to the use of transport. So what I mean by that is that at different times of day, I would like to see that that hydrogen economy is also interacting with the power sector so that when there is low demands in transport or maybe low demands for hydrogen in different parts of the network, actually there are opportunities to convert hydrogen back to electricity so that the, um, we can operate the power grids in a resilient um, and affordable manner. So the, what happens in other transport sectors and, um, and that that network shouldn't be exclusive to the transport and rather it should be open to interactions is power um, interactions to the rest of 
power grid is my answer to in terms of it's becoming enough for the uh, decarbon for this um, hydrogen decarbonization of transport. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you, thank you, Nezumi. Actually, uh, the next next person is Mark, who and like you argue is a he's an expert in symbiosis, and that's a good good person to bring in next is Mark Lewis from the Tees Valley Combined Authority. Um, Mark is a technology and innovation officer. Um, since 2015, he's been working with what is now the Tees Valley Combined Authority. Um, and that's been developing the Teesside Collective and turning that into an industrial carbon capture and storage network. Um, his focus is now working on how to show how the region can underpin achieving the UK's decarbonisation goals through industrial symbiosis, um, as well as district heating, energy storage, and in particular, as an increasing use of hydrogen in transport and heat applications. And the question will come to you now, Mark, is a hydrogen for transport value chain, a value chain efficient enough? And does that really matter? Yeah, thanks for that. And thanks to uh, everybody for, for joining the conference. Yeah, interestingly enough, I, I read some comments from the uh, chairman, I presume, of uh, Volkswagen talking about um, battery electric cars versus hydrogen cars and really saying, from their point of view, batteries win hands down because of this efficiency argument. But, but uh, I think where, where we come from, first of all, is, is I think the point was made earlier that you can't see hydrogen in isolation purely for transport. You've got to see it in relation to the energy system. Um, and how it interacts with other energy sources and, and how it provides you a, an opportunity for decarbonizing by using uh, energy from a variety of sources and storing that and, 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 uh, and then deploying it later on. Um, the other thing that I would point out is you're in a climate emergency, for goodness sake. Actually, this is about making big changes in the next few years. And there's a whole, we're going to have to get a contribution from a whole variety of sources in hydrogen, one of them. I think uh, in, we see in the combined authority, the main contribution is in the transport field is probably going to be in the heavy goods vehicle, which uh, a colleague from Cranfield talked about. And um, the recent announcement that the Tees Valley um, is going to be a, a hydrogen transport hub, development hub centre. Um, I suppose, shows that. And, and we see that um, building um, uh, transport logistic hubs based around hydrogen um, in centres where hydrogen is likely to be produced in volume and be a, for a modest cost is, is going to be a sensible way forward. Uh, it's interesting, the operators are interested in total cost of ownership. And, and you have to see that in relation to a changing um, regulatory and tax regime we're going to have to have if we're going to do the decarbonisation we're saying we're going to need to do it it means that you know the the cheap fossil fuels will probably have to have to disappear and you're going to be having to use more expensive renewable fuels um, for it and I think the other thing that um, people have have mentioned is things like hydrogen for, for air transport I mean particularly interested from our point of view in sort of seeing sustainable aviation fuels made from hydrogen. It's got a role in, in that field as well. So I think um, the efficiency argument I accept is there. It's only if we start using it, we'll start to understand how we can drive the costs down. And as I say, we're facing a climate emergency and efficiency has to I say, stand in line with other perhaps more important goals. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, next, we've got uh, Dawei Wu, Dr. Dawei Wu from the University of Birmingham. Um, uh, he is a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering and an EPSRC fellow at Birmingham. Uh, Dawe is part of the Vehicle Technology Research Centre. Uh, he has published over 50 uh, peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in, in mechanical and marine engineering, mainly around power generation systems, decarbonisation, cryogenic energy applications, novel linear energy generators and zero carbon propulsion. So Dawe, the question really is around, um, is a hydrogen for transport value chain efficient enough? And does this really matter? Thank you very much, Andy. Um, also, thank you for other panelists. Um, I think the hydrogen for transport value chain could be very long. We just um, think a scenario case if um, in Norway, um, either the uh, renewable electricity electrolysis sites or the um, uh, steam mass and reforming generate some um, hydrogen, then we um, compress it, liquefy it, then transport to Japan. Um, so that could be a very long value chain from the production 
the uh, transport, the loading and the receiving terminals and the, the final distribution. Now, looking to this very long value chain, I think the, uh, the energy loss are mainly from the production. So as we uh, heard from the previous presentation, I think uh, both um, kind of mainstream production, the electrolysis or SMR is about like 60, 70 percent efficiency. Um, the transport loss is about only 10 percent. So it could be um, could be not so significant compared to the production. So from the uh, thermal dynamic point of view for the electrolysis we use electricity inputs renewable electricity inputs so we're basically using high quality energy to generate some fuel um, thinking of the fuel um, the hydrogen use in the fuel cell it's uh, only about 16 percent efficiency so the efficient loss efficiency loss is significant if we um, convert electricity to hydrogen um, also from a dnv a report, uh, the surplus renewable electricity, um, the, the hydrogen production won't be the first option to use those surplus um, electricity. Uh, directly battery storage or um, even use the electric heating uh, could be a, a better option compared to uh, converted to the hydrogen. Um, uh, but the thing is, um, um, although it's not so efficient in terms of a thermodynamic uh, point of view, mm -hmm. but the uh, hydrogen production with renewable electricity does create a solution um, for medium to long periods and a large scale renewable energy storage. I, I don't think the battery can provide the, 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 the compatible, this kind of medium to long periods or large scale storage as a hydrogen fuel storage could provide. Um, and also the very high energy density uh, onboard storage for medium and the long distance transport, which again is uh, not, um, um, can be provided by the battery so far. So uh, my answer is uh, efficiency uh, does matter, uh, but uh, we need to con consider a matrix rather than, you know, the only uh, single factor. So the matrix should be, um, including system efficiency, um, also carbon intensity. Uh, there's a lot of host spots uh, of carbon will generate in this uh, value chain. So we need to look into that as well. And also very importantly, cost. So if we put all these factors in a matrix, then we can decide if this value chain is good or not. Thank you. Great, thank you, Doe. And then uh, last of all, we have uh, Nixon Sunny. And uh, he's from Imperial College, and he's a research assistant in the Center for Environmental Policy. Uh, he's also part-time policy advisor for the hydrogen economy team at Bayes. And currently, he's exploring multi-stakeholder business models for investments in low-carbon energy and geoengineering systems. So, Nixon, um, is, is a hydrogen for transport value chain efficient enough? And does that really matter? Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks to all the conference attendees and to my fellow panel members for actually making my case very much easier. Um, I think quite a lot of what's important has been said in the context of hydrogen for transport. But what I'll sort of add on that point of total cost of ownership is that I firmly believe in the context of hydrogen for transport, what is truly important in this particular case is range and refueling time. When we're thinking about applications, whether that's in passenger uh, mobility or whether it's in heavy goods or, you know, large distance freight, et cetera, we find that if we have a shorter range, that increases our need for a shorter refueling time. And a longer refueling time means that we really need a very long range to compensate that. And efficiency is massively important in that we don't want to make, you know, vehicles or vessels larger than, larger than they need to be in order to be able to actually deliver on what we need uh, for transport. But beyond a certain point in vehicle size or vessel size, there's not that much value in trying to maximize efficiency at the expense of other costs. If we look at, say, for example, solar panels, they're about 10 or 15% efficient in con converting sunlight to electricity. We know that we can do much better, but at much higher cost. So we decided to stick with a happy medium where we can get the service that we need at an affordable price. And I think that's the right mentality to take with mm. applications and questions of this nature. 
we have to judge it within the context of the whole system, but also recognize that when we strive towards efficiency and improving efficiency, as we should, we have to account for the other variables such as cost, um, range, all the application oriented uh, metrics that we have to be aware of. Great. Thank you, Nixon. I think um, that's a good kind of summary of everyone. Um, I think everyone's touched on all the key points on that. I think my my thoughts are that it's we're trying to decarbonize everything, not just transport. Mm -hmm. And because we have to do everything, then we need to think about every and the best option for everybody. So uh, it's difficult to make an argument that we shouldn't consider the hydrogen in transport context or in, in other contexts just yet. We shouldn't be ruling things out, ruling things out too early. Um, so basically the next question I'm gonna go to you in a slightly different order. It's gonna be, well, the, the first person is gonna be different, but the order is gonna be the same. So I started off with Tony first, this time I'll start with Nazami and we'll go through the, everyone in the same sequence. Um, so, um, First question to go to Nazami is, does the panel have a view on the existing, in using the existing DAS network infrastructure for transporting hydrogen? And what are the implications for transport? Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, I think there is definitely scope where the economics make sense in terms of um, demands and the infrastructure costs, but I think there is definitely the scope that we will see an integrated hydrogen system where maybe the hydrogen can be delivered by gas network or it could be delivered by, um, by tankers in liquid form, or even maybe it could be generated at the point of demand if we were to be able to achieve uh, significant developments uh, with the electrolysis technology. So um, yes, there is where the economics make sense, Yes, and I think as we are, what we are also seeing in the rest of Europe, and I think um, I can't remember whether it was Danielle or the previous speaker was talking about um, development of hydrogen as a in corridors. In other words, in a more regional or county level or local, whatever we call. I think in the future we are going to see these pockets of hydrogen areas where whether they could be also around. Um, as Mark was talking about, they could also be around industrial clusters because we know that government is very keen. There has been lots of funding going into the decarbonization of industrial clusters, which are also expected to include um, hydrogen. So we could see these, um, we could use existing gas network, but however, the key issue is really coordination and integration of hydrogen networks. So in other words, um, who is responsible at the point of if it is um, HGV fueling station, for example, who is operating that when the gas coming, the hydrogen coming from gas network, its pressure point, et cetera. And then when it is coming from tankers or maybe there is an electrolyzer at the back of the forecourt for uh, electrolysis generation at the point of use. So I think that coordination and integration of that integrated hydrogen infrastructure is becoming really, really important. And I think there we will see, and because of obviously there are other issues around health and safety, et cetera. So we will see that, I would anticipate to see that there will be, um, we need a clear regulatory framework and policy guidance so that all those issues across the supply chain, whether it's about the safety of hydrogen, its production or its distribution, or it is storage, those, those are organized and coordinated in an efficient manner. And, um, and I think when we are doing that, also we also need to recognize that that, um, that approach needs to be strategically organized in the sense that obviously the past um, infrastructure uh, systems have developed over the centuries, they were piecemeal, et cetera. So we need to take a strategic view as to, okay, where these industrial clusters are, where is the backbone of HGV potential network and how do we start investing so that we address the chicken egg problem that is mostly associated with the hydrogen um, economy. So yeah, coordination integration is essential and there is lots of role for poly and lo lots of role and creative thinking is needed in terms of addressing all the relevant uh, policy, regulatory, um, environmental standards, and et cetera. 
Great, thank you, Nesmi. Uh, Mark? Oh, I don't think he's heard me. <laughs> he's on mute, it seems, Mark, Andrew. you're on mute. Sorry, I'm just saying, coming from the Tees Valley, we've had, we've had a hydrogen distribution network in place for decades, actually, um, for industrial use, admittedly. Um, I think use of the, of the gas network, I think, is important if we're, we're concerned about, I suppose, the cost of hydrogen and producing it at scale, at quantity. I mean, economies of scale will apply to hydrogen production, and there'll be places in the country where it's best to make it, either from steam methane reforming with CCS along the East Coast, where we've got access to stores uh, and in certain locations on the west or where we've got large amounts of renewable wind coming again the east coast of england so you're, you're looking at um you know the opportunity there for it to be produced at large scale in, in at locations there and then you've almost got to use the gas network to get it out to the consumers um you you could move it by road but if we're going to do it at scale and certainly if we're going to use it in the heat the heat uh, application and we're going to have to get it out in the gas network. I think for transport, it's going to be interesting whether we can um, take hydrogen out of the gas network and clean it up to the to the state we need to put it into fuel cell vehicles. I mean, I think that is a, an interesting point. Um, the other the other point I would make, which seems to be sort of large, to an extent ignored, is the use of hydrogen directly in combustion engines, which I mean is possible certainly at, at, at percentages and maybe even up to 100 percent. So I understand now. So, uh, you know, that would that would allow us to use the gas network more widely for, for fueling vehicles, I think. Um, but I, but I think, yes, it's got a big role to play, obviously, in heat and to an extent in transport, if we can if we can find ways of, of deploying it into uh, into into fuel cell vehicles. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dawei. Thank you, Andy. Um, actually, uh, my comment is um, um, obviously uh, the. Um, the five uh, gas network company in, in, in the UK are already starting to blend um, up to 20% hydrogen into the gas grids by uh, 2023. Um, I think a lot of um, um, the low pressure, high pressure pipe already hydrogen compatible. Um, in the short or medium term, um, blend gas obviously be very helpful to um, uh, decarbonize uh, domestic, sec uh, domestic heating sector or the uh, industry cluster. But if um, um, the hydrogen uh, fuel uh, transport need to um, utilize this kind of gas network, some kind of necessary facility need to be in place firstly. Um, we understand that the pipe work, they're okay to uh, blend like up to 20%. But if the, um, um, the kind of the, the percentage of the hydrogen blend into the uh, uh, the gas network even higher, then lots of things need to be replaced. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, that, um, that the compressor need to be uh, replaced. The current uh, compressor, they cannot um, um, be with uh, higher than 30% hydrogen in the system. Um, and, and another thing is that um, we, when at the refueling station, we need to have hydrogen separation technology available as well. So currently we have uh, different types of uh, separation technology like pressure swing, absorption, membrane separation, or the uh, electric uh, chemical hydrogen separation. So both of them, they are very uh, expensive and quite uh, bulky to be uh, placed in the, uh, the refueling station. Uh, if you're looking to the UK uh, H2 mobility, they have uh, 14 uh, refueling station. Uh, mo all of them, they're still using cylinders to, to supply the, the hydrogen. So before we have those uh, technology available, I think the gas network will be um, a slightly different to be directly used for um, the, the on land, this kind of uh, vehicle application. Uh, I guess that's just my uh, personal point of view. I'm more comfortable talking about uh, marine and the real sector. If I remember correctly uh, yesterday, I think Alstom, they built their own on-site supply um, rather than using the, 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 the gas network uh, directly. I, I think marine is in a very similar uh, position. Um, it's a little bit kind of um, a self-contained system. I remember about five or six years ago, I firstly did the research on the uh, the first LNG powered uh, vessel in, in Sweden. Um, they have only uh, kind of the world's first bunkering vessel to fuel that, um, uh, the ferry boat. 
So uh, it could be a very similar case for using um, hydrogen in, in the marine sector. Um, plus that, um, uh, as Mark said, um, there's a lot of offshore wind um, um, facility available. The, very likely the hydrogen production from those sites will be firstly available for marine rather than inject the hydrogen into the gas network, then separate it to be used for any uh, you know, marine applications. So that's my comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dawe and uh, Nixon. Thanks, Andy. Um, so in my view, this is a slightly tricky question. I'll try and unpack what I mean. So reusing the gas grid for transport and hydrogen is largely an economic no-brainer because of the that you get to reutilize a lot of investments and decade growth of natural gas pipelines that's been built out in the UK. But it's not a given because we'll still need gas in this decade and most likely in the next two. So there, and there are also industries that rely on natural gas uh, lines and we simply can't convert all of the natural gas network to be able to transport hydrogen everywhere. It will probably have to be done in a very highly localized manner in regional pockets, uh, as one of our panel members alluded to earlier. And this means that we'll most likely develop new pipelines for expanding the hydrogen network, at least in the initial phases and most likely within the next decade or so. But given that paradigm, the tricky question is how do we develop you know, new standards, new specifications, um, to be able to actually have hydrogen that could be used across a range of different applications, whether that's industrial heating, possible use in domestic heating, or even in transport applications. How do we devise the network to be suitable for all without sort of limiting um, the potential to be used in one particular context? And you know, how, how might we sort of approach that question that uh, Mark alluded to, which is, do we need to have further cleanup in the gas network when we're having and taking hydrogen out at the end of the line? Uh, do we need to ensure that the hydrogen that goes into the gas network has a higher purity in the beginning? So this is an active area of work within the government and industry more broadly. That could have knock-on effects for how hydrogen is rolled out across that transport application on the whole. But um, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions around the reutilizing point, and that stems mainly to do with how you might supply hydrogen in the future. If we're starting to have a lot of steam methane reformers, we're going to need additional pipelines in different parts of the country to bring in more gas. So that might mean that we need those assets where they are. And it, we might also need additional lines uh, to be able to redistribute the hydrogen to consumers. So there's a lot of moving pieces. And I, I guess what I would say is I reiterate the fact that we need to have more evidence appraisal, as Danielle mentioned. And there's a lot of questions around quality and standards that certainly needs uh, direction from uh, government as well as industry. Great, thank you very much, Nixon and Tony. I agree with uh, everything that has been said. Uh, the only uh, addition I could make is that if we couple the 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 demand for hydrogen for the transport sector. Uh, to the supply of hydrogen required by the uh, heating systems, then we could take advantage of the learning rates and um, we could see decreases in, in other areas of the supply chain. Um, for that as well, subsidies could, could play a role. If you look at what happened with Japan in the in the um heating system with the subsidization of these uh, micro chp fuel cell systems uh you could see that for every um every time that uh, the production was double there was a a fall of 16% of of the prices of the of the technologies so there are additional benefits of, of using of using the, the gas grid to supply hydrogen, in addition to everything else that has been said. Also a good idea to avoid the stranded assets, bearing in mind that we have to phase out uh, uh, natural gas. Using this type of infrastructure could contribute to, to keep uh, maintaining jobs and industries in the country. Right, thank you. Thank you, Tony. I think um, 
we move on to the next question now, and it will be coming to Mark first. Um, do you think that there are small scale entrepreneurial opportunities in one of these domains around hydrogen production, distribution, storage, engineering, or support? The, the short answer is yes. I think uh, the combined authorities see that uh, um, hydrogen and, and its uh, deployment provides substantial opportunities for employment growth in, in our region as elsewhere in the UK, really. Um, I, I know that things like production may well be um, dominated by um, larger scale organizations. Um, you know, the, the, um, but there's going to be a lot of opportunity, I think, for smaller companies to be involved in the deployment of that, particularly on the infrastructure. I mean, we're involved at the moment with looking at hydrogen filling station deployment in the region. Um, you know, and there are opportunities around around putting those stations in, which are employing smaller companies. In fact, our stations are likely to come from a small company anyway. Um, just because they're able to be more flexible and uh, and support our, our particular requirements at the scale we can we can afford. So, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. I, I certainly think the infrastructure deployment in the gas network is is a is a big opportunity for retraining, reusing uh, existing skills. I mean, um, as as I suppose the um, oil and gas sector has is winds down, there's got to be something else for those uh, people that staff to do, and putting them into the hydrogen. Um, sector seems a, an eminently sensible way of using using their existing existing skills. Um, so I, I believe there are there'll be big opportunities. It may be that things like vehicles and um, you know maybe uh, electrolyzers and such like are going to be dominated by large scale multinationals. But even so, there's an opportunity if we expand in the UK for those companies to locate. Um, activities here, and and I think that's the kind of thing that authorities like ours see as being uh, as being part of the the opportunity that hydrogen presents. Yeah, on that mark, um, having tried to build an electrolyzer myself, I found that actually it's not buying the big bits that's difficult. It's all of the small pieces that go mm -hmm. to build your big system. You know, special components and stuff. The supply chain around it, I think, is so. Well, there, there's there's a lot, and there's a lot of opportunity for others as well. Around, let's even say, legal advisors, insurers. I mean, we've had to deal with all of those people, and they've got to get familiar with hydrogen and how that's deployed. And it's an opportunity for those organisations to, you know, develop those services and make them available more widely into other markets. Yeah, yeah, hydrogen is quite bespoke. Okay, so Dawe. Thank you, Andy. Um, it's a difficult question for me as an academic. Um, I will set up my company if I know a golden idea, I guess. <laughs> so um, some comments um, in terms of my understanding. Okay, so um, firstly, uh, the hydrogen infrastructure will have uh, gradually rolled out in the next decade. Uh, but uh, most infrastructure, they're talking about very high uh, capex and opex, uh, which makes it very, very much a capital gain. So as Mark said, um, big company um, will be uh, heavily involved, but um, if there's a, a small market for this SME, I don't know. But there's still some niche markets, especially in service and support, I think may be the opportunity for SMEs. I come across a company who is interested in artificial intelligence and the, and the machine learning to diagnose the potential leakage of the existing LNG pipe system. Uh, maybe the future blend gas network will also need this kind of uh, service, uh, even the pure hydrogen gas network. We don't have a lot of um, a policy and a regulation ready for this kind of uh, hydrogen gas network. Maybe there's a small market um, existing for SMEs. Um, and also some experience from the, the Far East in, in, in China, in, in Korea and Japan. I think some private um, refueling station um, has attracted a lot of interest for, for private money to invest in. Um, so I guess um, that's the answer from me. I will leave the time to more educated panelists to answer the question. Thank you, Dawe. Um, Nixon? Thanks, Andy. Um, so I would say most certainly there are a lot of opportunities in the various parts of hydrogen and CCS value chains. But most importantly, I think looking forward, uh, the supply of hydrogen may be quite distributed with more and more electrolysis coming on in the later decades. And we'll need technologies and commercial capabilities for scale up, but also storage. At the moment, we're talking about large scale storage in salt caverns and other large geological structures. 
but they're fundamentally constrained by having a certain type of geology um, and are inherently unsuitable for off-grid or off-network applications. So how do we ensure security of supply in those regions? We need storage technologies that could be used reliably at low to reasonable cost. And similarly, there's, you know, in a different context, there's plenty of scope for independent gas transporters to build new connections, to expand from initial supply, um, appliance manufacturers to develop smaller but more cost-effective end-use appliances, whether that's boilers or whether that's industrial appliances. I would say that the future is very much bright for the small-scale entrepreneur. Thank you, Nixon. Uh, Nazmi? Um, I agree with what has been said so far that I would envision in the future we are going to have lots of different sizes of generators or so producers. I think mainly I will think that producers and the storage are going to be the key areas where we will see more new um, actors operating. It's partly because um, I think as Nixon alluded to, I would anticipate that hydrogen can play. I think in a significant part of hydrogen network or hydrogen economy will be that it can contribute to resilience operation of power networks. So in terms of taking part in ancillary services market or even um, taking part in the balancing market, hydrogen has that dual role and the actual value through the development of artificial intelligence or other methods will actually come from which part of the supply chain offers the better value. So maybe at night or during day, certain times of day, or maybe even with smart planning and then smart cities and et cetera. We, will, we could see that, or well, actually, I only know that on Tuesdays in this fueling station, there are only going to be five trucks that need X amount of hydrogen. So that's why I have opportunity to convert that hydrogen that I'm not going to use into electricity and then uh, trade and then extract the value or do something in real time, look at energy markets and then, or oh, price of electricity is increasing because there isn't enough wind, how much I can sell that. So I think, through that, similar to VTG concept that we are seeing in electric vehicles, I would envision that. I mean, obviously, all of this is depends on the um, in, um, improvements in the cost of electrolyzers and how efficient those technologies are going to be. Um, but nonetheless, I will see that there are lots of opportunities around production and storage and all the other components that other panel members have alluded so far. Thanks, Nazmi. Uh, Tony? We publish a report for the uh, hydrogen fuel cell supergen last year. Um, I personally did a market research and I identified 196 companies in the UK working on the hydrogen and fuel cell uh, business. Um, from those, uh, 14 were working in production four on storage, five in distribution, and one in refueling. The data was mainly from 2019. In the last year, the market has exploded, and uh, we can see many more businesses coming into the market, right? Uh, so definitely, there are many opportunities along the supply chain. Probably, we have to think about the quality of those opportunities. Uh, it would be important to continue investing in research and development to have the patent for, for some of those uh, opportunities uh, and technologies. Um, but the reality is that, yes, um, we have a, a lot of small businesses working on this, but in the area of transport, for example, while everybody talks about how... Uh, hydrogen might be used for heavy goods vehicles. Um, the, the reality is that there are not uh, OEMs in the UK producing hydrogen fuel cell uh, heavy goods vehicles. The ones in, there are not in Europe. There is only, I mean, there are one in Europe that they say that they make this type of uh, vehicles. I haven't seen them. There is another in the United States. Haven't seen the real vehicles so i don't know if it's vaporware so you know there is a hype if you will in what hydrogen can mean for transport and what the reality is a site of of uh, a few buses uh not much is 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 happening 
So um, investment is, 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 is going to these areas. The FT, as I mentioned in my point before, has uh, uh, announced this opportunity and I've been one month trying to, to get any major OEM. I have contacted Volvo, uh, MAN, Scania, Daimler, Tesla, uh, uh, Heisen Motors, uh, Nikola, all of those ones trying to, to collaborate, to, to bid for that opportunity. And none of them was interested enough. What is happening is that the companies are bidding at this point, and that is the reality, I'm sorry to say, they are bidding for, for battery electric vehicles and potentially electric roads uh, in the roadmaps. And, and hydrogen is not gaining the traction that uh, I would like to see. So that will also influence, you know, how other smaller business can take opportunities, uh, can, can take um, advantage of those opportunities in terms of uh, developing the skills that are necessary for, for, for the supply chain and, and so on. So I guess that the opportunities at this point in time, time are more related with the deployment of hydrogen in the heating system, if you will. All right. Okay, thank you, Tony. I think... We've, we've actually run out of time. Um, I did promise three questions, four questions, but we've only managed three. And we will just have to imagine what that last question was. Um, but uh, thank you very much for everyone for, for um, being involved in this and, and giving us your, your clear views. I'd like to thank um, all of the panel for their time and, and their, their research, I guess, in answering and, and coming up with some of the answers to these questions. Um, Clearly, we've had a number of and a diverse set of ideas and, and ideas have been put forward. I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, I think 